So, welcome Steve Mathiser, or I used to call him Snuffleupagus because every meeting that I ever had scheduled with him, he never was there. So I actually didn't believe that he existed, so I'm glad that he actually does. Um, so in addition to his uh, instructing at SANS, um, and especially in the areas of ICS, I'm very curious what we're going to hear about the mousetrap because uh, I keep telling clients, and sorry for the vendors in the room, stop buying stuff. Let's make use of what we already have in place. So welcome, big warm welcome to Steve Madison. Hey, thanks. So I, I know a lot of the people in the room, but uh, I've done a lot of stuff in security and so on. I was a developer for seven or so years, so I got to learn operating systems and networks. And then somehow I stumbled into this security thing, and I've been doing that ever since. So. I've led security teams and I've uh, more recently moved to ION, so simultaneously we sell stuff and I'm going to tell you to stop buying stuff. Uh, so take that for what it's worth. Um, and uh, spend a lot of my time these days doing assessments, pen testing, that kind of thing. I teach for SANS in that same area. So I've seen uh, the inside of a lot of companies lived um, a lot of interesting projects, shall we say, in the industry. And uh, I've come to the realization lately that we've been um, seduced by the vendors and bought an awful lot of cool toys uh, and forgotten how to do security. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk to you about today. So will this play? No, do I need to play this from here? Come on. It's not playing, so we don't need to worry about that. If you Google, there it goes. So this is the Tom and Jerry mousetrap. Just to reinforce the fact that uh, we don't need to go to these lengths to capture at least most of the mice, right? Let's, let's start with the ones that are just sitting there eating the cheese. We don't need to uh, go to these lengths to get the low-hanging fruit, as it were. We seem to, if you look at this next one, this is more along the lines of what I see us trying to do for security these days. Uh, so there are a few points of failure or potential points of failure in this uh, process. And you know, who can tell me how all of those things work, what they're all doing, um, how to fix them if they break, which one broke, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I'll let, it's not that long a video, so I'll let it run all the way through to the end, but it gets kind of old at the end. But this is what we, uh, this is how we do security, right? We've got all of these tools, um, multiple instances of the same tool, all hopefully interoperating together until eventually, if all of it goes well, we will get to that mouse. I think we're close now. Yeah, exactly. Oh, sorry, I got to do another lap. <laughs> well, we're, we're almost there. So, and then we win, right? <coughs> then what happens? Then the mice learn some new tricks. And we are back to square one. So how, much, how many security tools do you have? What, what, kinda, what can I sell you today? I forgot how many there are up there. I think there's 32 things that I managed to come up with up there. I mean, who has at least half of the things on this slide somewhere in their environment? So now, uh, memorize this. So your operational security team, show of hands, who has zero to two people on their security team? Yeah, there's, there's a fair number. Who's lucky enough to have three to four? A few. More, five to six? Yeah, one or two hands. Seven to eight, anything bigger? So we've got, yeah, we're down to one hand. There are 32 tools here. Do the math, how many things does each person on your team need to be proficient or at least 
sort of, kind of competent in. Um, and what I see is this means we do nothing well. There, it just, you've got all this stuff and it's doing things and none of it is useful. So I'm going to start, I'm going to set the table a little bit at the high level um, and then I'll dig into some of the, the more technical details in terms of what I think you should be doing anyways. Uh, I've, I spent you know, 15 years in oil and gas, so simultaneously trying to provide security and usability, right? Keep customers happy. You've been convinced that this product is going to solve all of your ills, whether that's the usability ills or the security ills. But is that the right thing? So requirements. Who actually figures out what they need before they buy it? And did you talk to the right people to do that? Do you have the right requirements? Who did you talk to? Um, do they have a clue what they're talking about? And, and who did you miss? Miss. And, and now, okay, I, I'm, I love toys as much as the next guy. And in today's world, sometimes it makes sense to buy, buy the magic bullet. I'm not going to say next-gen firewall. Wait. Um, <laughs> but sometimes that makes sense. You know what? If I can do everything in one box, there's a lot less management load, a lot less configuration, upgrade, support, maintenance, all those things, right? But if I'm not going to use all of those features, um, those no longer become reasons to implement and buy solutions. So where can I spend my money and actually get some value from it? So we start, you know, architecture and design. That's where we start all of our projects, right? So do your architects actually, I hope there's not too many architects in the room, actually understand the technology landscape? How about the existing environment? Do they know how you operate? You know, Gartner says it's good, so it is, right? It's the best thing, but does that fit with the way my guys need to go and operate this environment. Um, if it doesn't interoperate or integrate with, with all of the other things that we are doing, or if we don't, um, I see strategic thinking in different ways. There's, yes, this is the wave of the future, cloud, right? That's the wave of the future. But at the same time, if I don't have a strategy in place for my company to get there, and to take all of these legacy things that are still going to be sitting around and I still need to make work and use and manage and integrate that with this hybrid environment that's going to be around for years and years, then that, that newfangled thing isn't going to give me any benefit for the next decade until I get rid of all of the old stuff. So can I interoperate? Can I manage? Do I get the visibility, the logging, the monitoring, the reporting? Can it scale? Yes. that. Swiss Army Knife does everything, so at what scale? And of course, um, we're seeing things move so fast today. I was just saying there are 52 vendors in the endpoint security space. So my advice to you would be think short term until they figure out how to get that number down below 20 at least. Because, you know, I would say more than half of those guys aren't going to be around in a few years or the products won't be anyways. So think, think, are we talking about the next year, the next two years, three, five, ten, on down the line? Project managers, I'm going to insult everybody equally today, I think. <laughs> uh, so I'm sure I've, I've seen a much gr greater level of dependence and reliance on project management over the last, say, five and ten years as opposed to before that time. And I've seen all kinds of project managers. Some of them think they're architects. Some of them think they're techies. So, but I know the one thing they, well, two things they all care about, three maybe, scope, budget, time. Do any of those things bear at all on what you are trying to accomplish in your security practice? Do you care about scope, budget, and time? Well, I mean, if you're a manager or you have to pay for your project, sure, you care about some of those things. But Th that's what a project manage manager cares about. So should they be the ones deciding how you are, well, A, what tools you're getting in the first place and how you're implementing them? And then, so we need to, and, and, and a project manager wants their project to continue, right? So they're going to try and scope it such that they can get it done within their budget. But 
you probably aren't going to be successful in actually doing a f what I see is you've got a project manager that says I've got this budget these resources this time frame we are going to to have this running by June 30th but if you want to do a good job of it you need to do some planning beforehand and actually figure out how you can implement this in a manner that's going to be usable after June 30th. And those two things are usually on opposite ends of the spectrum. I can't do a good job of implementing if I need to be done by June 30th. So then I end up with something, well, it's in, I check the box, and it's not doing what I want it or need it to do. And then you have the project resources who aren't really project resources. I'm sure we've all been there. We've got the business drivers versus the security versus the usability. And everyone's got realistic project deadlines, right? Yeah? No? So that's, this is what we end up with. Next, 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 next. <coughs> yep, I'm done. Wipe my hands with that. It says I'm done, right? It's complete. Light, lights are blinking. Uh, nobody's phoning me to say stuff isn't working. Uh, I can see the internet, and we're good, right? That's, that's what a lot of the implementations look like I see these days. So let's get vendor professional services in to help us. What do they know? If you're lucky, they know vendors. They know your product, or their product. Um, but do they know how you operate? Do they know enough about your environment? Have they asked you any questions about what you're trying to accomplish or how you work what other tools you have, what they need to integrate with, or are they coming in with their playbook and they're just going to check off all the boxes, do all the template configuration, and walk away? I know. So this is predicated on you having requirements in the first place, but do they know what your requirements are? And, and yeah, heaven forbid, do you share a common understanding of security? Because there are a lot of vendors that touch the security space that are not selling security products, and they are m much more focused on whether their products work, are usable, and so on. And of course, vendor professional services is expensive, so were they given enough time and budget to actually do a decent job? And then we get to everyone's favorite, documentation and knowledge transfer. Well, again, it's in, the lights came on, no one came running screaming, that's all we need to do, right? Did you budget enough uh, for the vendor to tell you what they did and show you how to do it yourself? And so the vendor tells you it's working. Do your two guys on your security team supporting 32 different uh, types of technologies, do they know enough to even figure out whether uh, it's working? And when it, three months down the road, have they done anything to make sure it continues working or is updated or patched or whatever? Are you afraid to touch it? Do you have something that was went out of support in 2010, 1999? I've seen both. So I'll just do this in-house. Like I said, next, 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 finish. I know my environment. I know what I need. I know my requirements because I actually did have them. So yeah, that, that light came on. It's working. I'm good. My, my, the easiest example I give for this is uh, storage. I bought a brand new sand switch, or my storage team bought a brand new sand switch. They plugged it in. It worked. Lights are on. They could see a LUN. That's it, right? There, there's no other potential configuration issues that might arise. There's no risk to just plugging something in, default credentials, leaving it on the network with holding the storage for pretty much everything in your environment, is there? And of course, Fred, and my daughter watched the Flintstones for the first time. Um, she's nine, but she had never stumbled across the Flintstones, and we were trying to explain that this is what we watched while we were growing up, but it wasn't like this. But, <laughs> So, uh, you know, Fred, the expert, and I'm not quite sure what made me think of Fred as an expert at anything, but was busy fighting fires, so Barney, the intern, did the install, right? Because your, your tech leads are too valuable to, to put in a room with a, with a vendor for however many days it takes to implement something, right? So then you get into the, well, it works as long as you disable that, you don't break my application. And you need to disable that in your security product because my application does crazy things. 
and uh, you break it. I'm not going to fix my app. I'm going to just disable your functionality. So it works, right? I enabled it. It broke a critical app. Uh, and you know, uh, we don't have anybody who knows how that app works. It just works, right? You're not going to troubleshoot that. I'm not going to help you troubleshoot that. We don't even know how to log into that server. Uh, so it's a problem with the security product, right? Let's just neuter it. So I need too many approvals. These are just, I've seen and heard all the excuses. He, the business needs to approve and the, you know, whatever, governance folks and the CIO and my manager and nobody wants to be that person that says actually push the button and do it. Let's turn on this awesome feature that gives me all the security in the world. But there's a 0.5% chance that the internet might go down for a few minutes. Well, that's too much risk. Right? No one's going to sign off on that. That's the risk to benefit, to implement. And of course, security has no benefit, right? I'm not a target. I don't, you know, park my car in the street. No one's going to come and pull on my door handles. Uh, or I've got to take an outage. Well, is that whatever that thing is that needs an outage? Is it redundant? Well, then you don't care about outages. Um, we don't know how to do that. We have no process. Nobody, you know, I need help from you to do that, but you don't know how to help me do it. Well, I guess we can't do it. And of course, I'm not getting paid for that. That's, we're never going to do it in that case. Or we've got other priorities. It takes too much time. My project deadline's the end of the month, whatever it is, right? There's a ton of excuses. Now, let's say we got it installed, whatever it is. It's in there. It's operating. All the security lights are blinking. So who's managing that day to day? Well, of course it's Barney, because we're not going to pay someone, you know, Fred, the experienced manager, operator, installer, to, uh, to, to run that. He, he earns way too much money to sit in front of a console and tune, m manage, monitor. Um, and, you know, with a team of two, I guess, everybody has to know everything anyways, but You've got to be on call. How many people in this room are on call or have teams on call? Right? There's a lot. So can you operate all 32 of those technologies at 2 in the morning without your cup of coffee? So how many tools or products does everyone have to know? Well, 32 divided by 2, that's at least 16. Um, and can any one of those people achieve an expert level understanding in whatever that critical security tool is? Can everyone? Probably not. And so, I don't know, who has time to actually keep, keep tabs on the products that they're installing, or that they're operating, sorry? What, what are the new features? You know, there's, there's a new version of whatever came out today. Does it have useful features? Will you ever look at those? Will you ever upgrade? Will you ever turn those on? Have the best practices changed? Um, is there you know, a new capability with a new best practice that would solve all your problems? Do you have time to look at that, figure that all out? And of course, who's watching logs and alerts and, and figuring out when stuff is broken? So perfect security, that's what we want, right? Everything, you know, the, the, I didn't put it in here, the, the Dilbert um, cartoon, right? In order to log in, you must stare directly at the sun. That way we can be secure, right? We're, I'm, I'm going to disable security. Um, we're not going to get there. You'll never get there. And, and it's, a, it's an admirable goal. It's something that should be in your sights, in your plans. But you're never going to get there. Let's, it's like I've had this discussion multiple times. Well, data exfiltration, and this is a bit of a tangent, but people are bringing data in and out on USB keys. So let's glue all the USB ports shut. Oh, but then they can connect to Gmail and transfer data that way. So let's block Gmail. And then they can um, burn it to DVD, or they can just bring in their laptop, or, or, or. And so you get the people that say, well, they're going to find a way. I'm, I give up. I'm not going to bother. Right? There's so many different ways to... Um, <coughs> suck at security or to <laughs> uh, bypass security, I'm just going to give up. I'm not going to bother. Well, if you never start, you're never going to get there. So let's forget about these idyllic goals of perfect security 
And let's see if we can get most of the way there with relatively little cost, little effort. You know, a well-implemented solution providing 80% benefit at 20% of the cost is way superior than something that might get you all the way to 100% if only you could do it, if only you could get it working and support it, and it was still working tomorrow. Right? Let's, let's start with what we can do. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the landscape of the problems. I could talk for a long time just about those, but that's not really why I'm here. What can we do? Well, I've got one, one hint. It doesn't come in shrink wrap of any sort or cardboard box. None of those things. It doesn't come in a big brown truck. Let's do more with less. Who in this room is doing more with less these days? Or less with less or something? You know, take your pick. So let's, let's focus on how we can do that, because we certainly don't have the money to go buy all these tools anyways. Um, let's understand what capabilities we have and actually leverage them. Because there's a lot of cool features that you may not be aware that you have. Or you may be aware, but you just haven't given any thought to them. Or you don't understand the value that they bring. Let's actually apply best practices. How about starting there? Um, you know, operate. Support, maintain, don't just keep firing in tool after tool after tool with blinky lights that, that you know, look cool, right? How about we upgrade occasionally? You know, that goes along with patching and all of those other things. And take advantage of those new features. Like, these vendors are at each other's throats. They are, it's a cutthroat business. They want their market share. They are implementing new capabilities, new features. Let's actually see if we can take advantage of them, because they're, they're doing a pretty good job of, of bringing out new capabilities. So use them. So really, like, this is not rocket science, but I don't see it done, or a lot of these things done, a lot. I mean, I'm sure you, you've heard all of the, the various red team pen testing talks. I mean, yes, there are talks, if you, you hunt around, on red team failures. But, you know, and they are spectacular sometimes, but they don't happen nearly as often as the, the successes from the red team perspective, right? So you should know your environment. I, I, it's the age, age old adage, right? Who can, who can produce today without having to sit down at a whiteboard or stand at a whiteboard a, an accurate diagram of their network, their environment? Without drawing it now. So what are you protecting? You know, we, we've all heard the stories, right? Enable all those features, follow the best practices. They are called best practices for a reason. Um, I get into arguments with my wife all the time about this. She's like, well, that's just um, your view. That's, that's the, hegemon, the hegemony's view, the, um, established, the establishment's view of what's a best practice. But we've got to start somewhere, right? Until someone comes up with something better, that's our best practice. So let's actually follow those. Egress filtering. Who blocks outbound access to the internet by default in their company? That is a scary small number of hands. Um, talking about the 80-20 rule, don't do anything else. I'm, and I can't say that, you, you know universally, but don't do anything else until you can control what goes out of your environment. And then, is it on here? Well, that SSL interception comes along with that. I will talk about that. If you, we, where I was at, we started, I don't know, we woke up one morning and we blocked outbound access by default. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. But we had a, an environment where you could not get to the internet except through approved methods, through proxies, uh, and the rest was blocked. So then along comes a sandboxing vendor, take your pick. Um, and what we would see is we would see uh, stager, stager, stager. Stage is getting dropped, right? Malware trying to execute, and nothing would happen because it could not talk out to the internet. And there's intelligent malware, and there's APTs, and blah, 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 and you can always find a way around things. But you can stop a huge amount of malware and other bad things, trademark, um, 
just by, by filtering egress traffic. If you can't do that, then you have no hope in hell. It doesn't matter what else you're doing because you are wide open to the internet. Multi-factor auth, uh, I've got slides on, on all of this, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but it's a necessary evil. It's necessary uh, for a lot of things. Management access, and I'm not talking about your domain admins. Yes, the company with 600 people and 85 domain admins was not in a very good place, but what about your infrastructure? How do you control management access to your infrastructure, your firewalls, your routers, your switches, your SAN switches? Don't forget about those, because uh, VMware backups are a great, or well, and VMware images of any sort are all that anyone needs to own your environment very, very quickly. What about the network infrastructure itself? You know, your, your network vendor has a ton of features that are probably turned off. Passwords, yeah, I gotta talk about passwords. I will try not to talk too much about passwords. There are things we can do better. And probably the hardest thing is the logging, monitoring, reporting. But again, you can't just throw your hands up and decide you can't do it. You gotta start somewhere. And I would argue that you don't want to start with everything and then trying to sift through that and find what you need to find. I, that is definitely not going to be uh, good for you. So I, you know, pick something, one thing. If you can pick the one most evil thing that could happen in your environment and alert on that and prove that you can alert on that. Step one. Step two, what's the next most evil thing that could happen in your environment? So we'll talk about that. So the network diagram. If you can't describe it to me, you can't defend it. It's, it's as simple as that. You have to have an understanding of your network. So how many organizations have a network team and a, sec and a security team? And how many of those security teams can actually tell you how the network is laid out? Right? Like, these are important things. You know, who controls DNS in your environment? Who, who creates provisions accounts? What, what should be logging into what? What should be talking to what? You, these, the silos kill me, really. Like, you need to have, you are not just paid to operate a firewall, or a SIM, or a remote access thingy me doohickey. You are paid to secure your environment. You need to understand your environment. Don't tell me that's his job to understand that application, that web server, that active directory, whatever it is. You have to have an understanding. And not only of the environment, but the risk. Let's, so we're doing more with less. Let's focus on where we actually need to, where we get the best value. I mean, you could have, you can find all kinds of talks on bang for buck, security value. Let's, let's actually understand what our business risk is and start tackling that. You know, let's, let's actually come up the stairs from the basement and talk to people. Understand what makes your company tick, what the pain points are, because you also got you still have to make this usable, whatever this is that you're putting together. Um, I've said this multiple times, um, and, and my experience has been that a good business analyst can help more than a handful of security practitioners in the right context, obviously, but they are the people that can actually take a technology, understand a technology or understand a problem and go over here and talk to the people that actually make money for your company and understand how those two things relate to each other. And they're also not afraid to talk to people and they're not afraid to document or put a process around something or figure out where we need to get and map out the steps to go from here to there. I'm one of those guys that goes from here to there, but there are people that don't do that and you need to go from, through all the steps, right? And, and of course, access needs to be reviewed, updated, managed, blah, blah, blah. We, you know, that's another one of those age old adages. So let's start by turning it on. Right? So what, what do most vendors sell you? They sell you something that you can plug in and be successful, for some definition of successful, with. It's 
bad business for me to sell you something that you plug in and it breaks your environment. So chances are the default configuration is not the one you want. So let's, let's actually, you know, again, back to the project manager. Let's play with this in a lab. Let's turn things on gradually. No one is saying you need to take every feature and light up the whole box all at once, whatever, you know, whether they're blades or this or features or whatever it is. You don't need to light them all up at once, but you need to have a plan to progress through that and start lighting them up. Turn on a feature, do some testing, make sure it works in the lab, turn that feature on in production, keep moving through. There are some pretty cool features. Uh, I think it might be on another slide, but who has visibility or even better yet, control over their DNS? Yeah, that's what I thought. For the record, zero. Um, but that capability is built into half a dozen different windows and security products that you probably have. So, you know, that might be something you want to look into. Positive enforcement model. That's, that's the buzz, buzzword, catchphrase, whatever you want to call it. How about we start with nothing and build up from there? Who's ever had the experience where they talk to the, we'll call them the webmaster, and who's trying to make their application work, and they say, well, the vendor... They say just allow everything out through the firewall. And I don't know what ports I need, what access I need. I don't understand really even what database I'm talking to and what application server I'm talking to. I'm just a web guy. I've just got a web server. So just allow me to talk to everything. And, and you know, you can lock it down after, afterwards. You can go back and look at the logs and figure it out and lock it down. Anyone had that experience? Anyone gone back and locked it down successfully and gotten permission to do that? That doesn't happen. So let's start you know, back to the project management discipline or the development discipline or the implementation discipline. You know what? It's not that hard. Let me sit down with you for an hour and we'll start turning things on. Oh, that's blocked. OK, that makes sense to allow. Let's allow that. Let's make that work. But no, bypassing all of the security because it's breaking my app is not the right answer. Let's blocked by default, which leads right into egress filtering, right? So who today really needs to connect to the internet for anything other than web browsing, for the average user, really? I mean, yes, you've got servers, you've got applications, they do stuff. But, okay, so let's block all the ports. Let's make sure everything else goes through something that can look at the traffic. I don't, know, I, uh, I don't know quite how feasible this is, but uh, John Strand, he's an instructor for SANS, he has a bit of a rant on the internet. And the crux of it is he's a proponent now of blocking access to the internet. Take the Alexa top 1,000, 2,000, 10,000, not million, but few thousand websites. Or take your own logs, assuming you have them and can parse them and access them. Um, take the top X thousand websites that your company has accessed in the last year, last six months, whatever. Whitelist them. Block everything else. Period. Now, I'm not saying make it hard to get unblocked. Provide when it gets blocked, there's a link. I click the link as a user, it gets unblocked. So what is more of a risk to you, right? How many websites are there on the internet? Billions? Hundreds of billions? I don't know. How many of those do you need to use in your organization? Even if it's millions, that's a very, very, very small percentage of the internet. So I, don't, I have never seen this in practice. This is John's thing these days. But you know what? Block it all. Take your top 10,000, allow those, and make it easy for people to allow the ones that they want. You are still, I tell you, you know, agrsqfyz.com is not going to be on that list of things that people need to access. Uh, along with the other, what, 40,000 a day malware sites that pop up, right? And, and all other ports, just, there's, there's no reason. I'll create exceptions as needed. 
gaming. You need gaming? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Because what else are they going to do the, the seven hours out of the day when they're not working? Intercept SSL. So I've, in talking to people, I have my idea of how many people are intercepting SSL. But for the record, who is intercepting SSL? I think I asked this already, and I only saw a couple hands. Yeah, there's a few. So knowing where you work, that's four companies. Um, and that's actually one more than I was aware of. So, if, so let me um, ask another question then. Who has an application sandboxing product? I'm trying not to mention vendor names. But something that, that purports to grab executables as they're downloaded and run them and tell you if they're safe and secure and so on. Who has a product or a feature like that? Really? Nobody? We've got a... Okay. So more than the four people who are intercepting SSL. Does anyone else see the disconnect here? What exactly is it that you are sandboxing if you're not intercepting SSL? Right? Like we've got to get some of these things <laughs> aligned in the right order here. SSL, what, 60% of normal traffic is SSL? I want to tell you, I don't know. Um, the vast majority of malware is using SSL in some way, shape, or form. So you intercept SSL, <laughs> egress filtering. If you do one thing, besides maybe multi-factor auth if you're not doing it already, intercept SSL because you cannot, you have all these products that purport to stop the bad. If they can't see the bad, they can't stop the bad. And you know what? Certificates, scary, right? They are not that hard. Spend you know, an hour learning how certificates work. Spend some time rolling this capability out gradually. Start with you know, your team, IT. It doesn't matter if it takes a year to roll it all the way out. You will have things that break. You will have to create exceptions. It's not a big deal. I come back to this with patching, with all kinds of things. Is the world going to end if that application breaks. I mean, we have a lot of people in this room, I'm assuming, with control systems. And they are critical, and they are. But do you guys have anything in your control that would prevent, you know, that would stop operations cold? Does anyone have anything that is in their purview that if it wasn't working would stop operations cold? So there's, there are some things, and, but there were three hands, right? You should know what those things are. You should be able to test and validate and make sure that they're working with whatever it is that you're implementing. And then we have these things called change windows, and we can schedule changes, and we can have people standing by just in case we do break things, and let's start turning this stuff on. Um, you know, again, URL filtering I put after the SSL interception because, again, if you're not intercepting SSL, um, you know, and HR, yeah, give them a list of categories. Let them come back and tell you what categories to block. I really don't care as long as you are blocking that category that's called malware or potentially unwanted software or unknown is another good one. None, yeah. right? Block those, at least, please. Uh, preferably advertisements. I didn't get to go to that presentation. Did anyone go to that presentation today? Anyone want to go back and block all advertisements now? Right? Like, let's, if HR says, no, we're not blocking anything, well, no one's going to complain if you block malware. All right? <laughs> let's, let's do that. And then, and then we get to the ennies. Rule of thumb doesn't apply across the board. But our most firewall rules have this thing called a source. Three columns. Source, destination, port. I do not want to see two any's in any firewall rule. Of that, those three things, no two of them should be any, ever. You can enumerate much better what you need access to. You need access to that web server, to RDP. Okay, I'm not allowing RDP to the internet. I'm allowing web server RDP. Never mind. But... Um, I'm allowing RDP access to that one server 
or this server needs access to the whole internet, okay, that source can get to any, but I don't want to see two any's in any rule. <laughs> and I, I mentioned it earlier, manage your DNS. All of the next gen firewalls, there I said it again, have a DNS capability of some sort. I don't care where you get your list, it could even just be reactive from an instant response perspective. But be able to tell where, so two things. One, be able to block DNS. If I, can, if I tell you this domain is evil, just, it's, tri it's the easiest way to stop anybody from accessing that domain, right? You're not gonna block the IP address. You're gonna block the domain. And yeah, there's, there's malware that takes advantage of multiple techniques to get around that. But still, I wanna be able to block a domain. Not only that, uh, it was Doug's presentation. Did Doug stay in the room? No, he's gone. Yesterday, right? You can get an amazing amount of intel from your DNS logs. Even if, even if you forget about the details and just look at the trending, all of a sudden I'm seeing spikes in this kind of domain or from this area, you know, quantity of DNS requests, DNS requests to certain countries, domains. Um, you, if you look at, if you understand your DNS, you will see. Same thing with the top 1,000 websites. You are resolving the top 1,000 DNS names all the time. The rest of it, especially if you trim them back down to the root domain, not the root, but, you know, to domain, like akamai.net. Yes, I know there's a bunch of stuff that comes in front of it. Strip that off. Um, but you can tell an amazing amount from what you're talking to from a DNS perspective. And you don't have to look at packets. You don't have to look at anything else. It will tell you right there. Multi-factor auth, I, I've got to bring it up just because there are still people not doing it. Um, and we can argue all day long whether Outlook Web Access should be included in this. Um, remote access certainly should. Um, your password safe, I love it when people integrate their password safe with Active Directory. <sighs> or better yet, when I come back the next year, they manually synchronize their Active Directory password with their password safe password since they now disconnected them. Um, you know, I've, I'm, I'm trying not to belabor the whole password thing. People suck at them. My experience, 90% or more of passwords start with an uppercase letter followed by a bunch of lowercase letters followed by some numbers. My, right now, that would be spring 2016, right? We're getting into summer 2016. You have anywhere more than 200 users, one of them is using that as their password, because guess what? We change it every 90 days. And I think I have a slide on passwords, so I'll save that for that slide. <coughs> Bottom line, I will guess a password. There is no doubt about it, especially since LinkedIn will tell me every user ID I need to know. So multi-factor auth, remote access, 100%. If I, can, if I can use that thing to get command execution in your environment, it better have multi-factor enabled. Password safe, yeah, probably. Uh, if you are one of those lucky people who has something like smart cards, they come with their own set of pain, I get it. But then start using that for network gear, you know, your infrastructure management. Email, we could argue about all day. Um, there, it's really hard to make email usable with multi-factor access, but at the same time, most pen tests, I will find the Outlook Web Access Portal and brute force passwords. Even if you're using multi-factor auth for your remote access, OWA is sitting there, I will guess passwords, I will send an email to everybody um, to find out who's out of the office, then I will phone the help desk and say, or better yet, if you're using a cloud-based ticketing system, I'll log in and create a ticket saying I've lost my RSA token or whatever it is, and then I'll phone the help desk and get you to give me one. Because I had some public way to guess your username, or your password. You know, if, you, if I can log into something in your environment, you're done. So management access to infrastructure. It's amazing how many times I go in and it's like, well, you can log into switches and routers from anywhere. Do you really have that many people administering your network? Firewalls too, right? Restrict by source IP and do not integrate with AD. Because, I, as I just explained, I will guess a, a password. I will then get an administrator password, and I'll get a domain admin password. And then I will add myself to whatever groups I need to add myself to to manage your firewall, to manage your whatever else. 
So do not use AD for that, but centralize it because those local passwords, you know, we suck at managing those too. So just spin up a radius server or something, stand alone, put accounts in it, manage those, because now you only have, well, two for most of you, or fewer, people who have accounts that I can try and brute force to get into your infrastructure. If you can manage out of, bound, out of band, by all means, do it. Um, please. It's not always that easy. Uh, lockout and password policies. So do I actually have a slide on passwords? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, but lock accounts out. Your administrators, we, we've just said you have separate accounts and passwords for managing your infrastructure. So those passwords can have a strong, those accounts and passwords can have strong policy enforced. I'm not going to go into what strong is on this slide yet, but, uh, you know, there's, there's different opinions there. And let's turn off Telnet and HTTP and RSH, please. You should be using encrypted protocols only. You should, and SNMP v1 and 2, for that matter. Um, you know, these are all real, really basic hygiene, but they, they make an attacker's life much, much harder. I'm going to have to work a whole lot harder to get a hold of your infrastructure if you do these things. From a network point of view, so private VLANs, turn them on for all workstations. Who, who can give me a legitimate reason for two workstations? And I'm talk, I mean, I'm sure there are cases, but your average user in a 5,000 user company, who, whose workstation needs to talk to somebody else's workstation? And as I say that, I'm thinking Skype, crap. Um, but <laughs> so allow them to talk Skype. But uh, still, you can segment. There's no legitimate reason for me to map a drive or to talk Windows management protocols except from my management network to end workstations. You know how quickly that stops me from wandering around your environment until I have admin access? Segment further if you can. Dynamic ARP spoofing, DHCP snooping, these are features. All switches have them. Again, they will prevent man-in-the-middle attacks. Well, not prevent, but they will go a long ways. Um, you have routing protocols. It's one line to put a key in those routing protocols so that I can't become a router on your network and route all the traffic through me. It's not hard to do. Same with HA, HSRP, VRRP, whatever it is. Unused ports. So the, the way I disable unused ports, that's hard, right? Well, how about I can, I actually haven't written it, so I shouldn't say I can give you a script that will connect via SNMP v3 to all of the switches in your environment and list all of the down, the ports that are down. Store that away. Come back two weeks later. If any port is still down, it gets disabled. And I do that, you know, do that during prime time when ports are expected to be active. You can automate that easily so people can't plug in. I mean, is it your biggest risk? Probably not, but, but we have ports everywhere. Right? It's, that's, that's a trivially easy thing to do. Back up your configurations. Then make sure I can't TFTP to the TFTP server where the configurations sit with the passwords in them. Detect changes. If you're backing up your configs, you should get an alert every time a config changes because you're certainly talking network infrastructure, that shouldn't happen that much. And I mean, tune as appropriate for your environment, so on and so forth. But, um, and update the software. Again, you've got two big chassis-like switches in your data center, probably, probably more. It, there's this thing called HA, failover, fault tolerance. Use it, fail over to this one, update this one, test, fail back. We don't have to be on the every three year update cycle for our network infrastructure. Passwords, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go into it in depth. Long passwords, long passwords, forget complexity. I'm sick of complexity. Do not change them every 90 days. Um, I think that was another John Strandism. You know where that came from? 1984, NIST Green Book. Um, audit recommendations because at that time it took about uh, six months to crack an eight-character password. 1984, folks. I don't know when more games came out, but it was probably before that time. 
All right, so this whole concept of a password change every 90 days is bullshit. That's how we end up with spring 2016, summer 2016, fall 2016, winter 2016. Let's just make passwords long. And if you have anyone complain to you that they can't type long passwords, send them a text message. Ask to see their text messages. If you can type on your frickin' phone that much, you can have a long password. Thank you very much. Um, manage the local passwords, whether that's switches, routers, servers, whatever. Do not use group policy preferences. If you don't know what those are, Google GPP. Um, if you, even if you're not using them today, make sure you weren't using them five years ago and still haven't changed that password. Uh, Microsoft has a tool that people are finding ways to leverage as well, but it's, it's new-ish called LAPS, Local Administrative Password something, uh, that allows you to manage unique local admin passwords for every device in Active Directory. Again, if I pop Active Directory, you're done, but that's still better than having the same admin password on every <coughs> box. Don't surf from your administrative account, right? Separate accounts for admin access. Granular, don't have 89 out of 600 users, or sorry, that wasn't, yeah, it was 600 users be domain admins. Deprovision access when people don't need it. Um, talking about alerting. If you, uh, uh, you should be at a state where you could alert every single time a domain admin logs in interactively. And for different definitions of interactively. Why not? You should be in that position. Or when someone grants themselves that kind of access, you should be able to log that. Talking about logging. Pick one thing. That's a good one and log and alert on that. Once you've got that working, let's start by getting the logs, of course. But, and you can do the trending, DNS trending, I talked about that. But pick one thing. Alert on it. Log in as domain admin. Addition to domain admin group. Service creation, because a lot of malware creates services. Just to get their privilege escalation, and then the service goes away. You should know when a service gets created, because that shouldn't happen that much. So pick one thing. Alert. Tune it. Pick another. Keep going. You know, there's these buzzwords like continuous improvement. Do it. It's back to that, yeah, it's hard, but just sitting back and giving up isn't the answer either. So, um, you know, get better over time. So, really, in summary, let's get the basics right. None of these things require you to purchase a product. Multi-factor auth, potentially. I mean, there is Google Authenticator. That'll work in a pinch. Advanced firewall features like URL filtering, maybe there's, you know, I'm not saying there's no cost, but very little of what I've talked about today requires you to buy something. It's configure the stuff that you have. Go back and look at what the stuff that you have can do and configure it to do it. I will take one capable person over, number one, over four incapable people, and number two, over any magic bullet product, right? One person can make a huge difference, and that person is typically someone that understands what a packet looks like, that can parse through a ton of data. It's not a person that has the, who is a something something certified expert, right? Um, you already have the products, so take the time. You know, honestly, the other way to look at this is hire that guy straight out of university and throw him in there and say, learn this stuff, figure it out, and tell me what I can do better, right? That's, that's, either way, let's, let's get this stuff right before we go out and shell out more cash. So, end of rant. <laughs> <laughs> Intercepting SSL, so HTTPS, and checking to see that it is HTTPS, <coughs> I should have the same effect of blocking yeah, well, I mean, I think malware. Let, let's say you're using, if you're using like an ancient firewall and you're doing SSL detection on port over three, yeah. and it's not using SSL, you wouldn't even have to be decrypting it. You would just say, oh, that's not actually SSL, that's just 
Right. Encrypted traffic will be clear. Yeah, my, I'd say, not, I don't really know proportionally, but let's say representative 500 samples I've looked at in the past two years, uh, maybe 5% of that search or something. Yeah, no, I'm, I agree. You're, I was wrong. Um, but a lot of it is port 443. By intercepting SSL and making sure it is HTTP over SSL, or on whatever, making sure that it's encrypted HTTP traffic on port 443, you are still preventing all of that. Any other mistakes? <laughs> Steve, I think you have written that script before. Yeah, I might have. Two other free additions. I guess our low cost additions will be security or Yes. But you're not a target, so it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Second that one. Yeah. One last one. Can we, re can we reach that point where it's time to just play this I, You know what? That has, that, I find that to be a very intriguing option. <laughs> if I had a, you know, a small environment that I owned, I would consider doing that. I really would. Because you know, we really only use this small little piece of the internet day to day. You know, you've got your email, your social media, and your sports. And then the business category, and you're done. All right. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Much appreciated for your support today. Thank you.